Thank you all very much. Welcome. My name is Eric Olson. I'm the Deputy Director of the Latin American Program here at the Wilson Center and also uh, Special Advisor to the Mexico Institute. Um, delighted to have you here this morning. I think there are a few, few more people stuck in the security line downstairs. They will be joining us, um, but we are delighted to have this uh, talk with our good friend Guadalupe Correa Cabrera and a number of excellent panelists who I also consider friends. So thank you all for coming. Um, as you, as has been reported, and you've probably seen many places, Mexico had a pretty rough year last year. Homicides were uh, soared to a record level of somewhere between 25,000 and 30,000. I've never gotten a sense of the exact number, but somehow by breaking through the $25,000, uh, dollars, uh, 20,000, dollar uh, 25,000 number, they have set a record for homicides in a year, uh, intentional homicides, and that's about 69 murders per day, which is a really uh, terrifying and uh, uh, really alarming number. We asked a number of experts, security experts in Mexico to reflect a bit on why homicides have gone up so much and what could be done about that. One of them is Guadalupe Correa Cabrera, but a number of others. And I just, I, I raise that simply because I think these papers have been really helpful and useful. Uh, we have photocopied them, they're on the back table and I hope you'll take advantage of, of looking at those. They're online. For those of you following us online, they're on the Mexico Institute's web page. So it's been an incredibly difficult year, and I think a lot of us assume uh, a lot of that homicide, not all of it, has to do with criminal organizations and conflicts in Mexico. But today, we want to take a slightly different focus. We don't want to look solely at the homicides, their intensity, their cruelty. We want to look more closely at the criminal organizations behind the homicides. What drives them? How are they organized? How do they operate? And ultimately, hopefully, have some insight about how the U.S. and Mexico and other countries can really deal more effectively with criminal organizations. To help us in this exploration, we are going to take advantage of the work of our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Guadalupe Correa Cabrera, who has written the most thorough book I am aware of, uh, of one of Mexico's notorious criminal groups, Los Zetas. Um, uh, the book, which you can purchase from the publisher uh, outside on, and online, uh, is, uh, is called, well, it is an in-depth look at this particular criminal organization, but also looks at its uh, enterprise, aspects of its criminal enterprise, its unique cor corporate organization, and its expansion into multiple criminal markets beyond drugs, including human sm smuggling and trafficking, extortion, and even the energy market. We've also assembled a group of expert panelists who will help us contextualize this issue based on their own research and writing about criminal organizations in Mexico, the United States, Latin America, and around the world. Let me introduce all of our speakers. As I've mentioned, uh, Dr. Guadalupe Correa Cabrera is the author of Los Zetas, Inc., Criminal Corporations, Energy, and Civil War in Mexico, published by the University of Texas Press uh, in 2017. Dr. Correa is associate professor at the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. We were also honored to have her here at the Wilson Center from September, 20, September 2016 through August 2017, where she was a Wilson Center fellow, and she worked on her book during her time uh, here at the Wilson Center. Prior to coming to Washington, she was an associate professor at University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley in Brownsville, Texas. And I mention that because really, I, when I went to visit her there, her house was literally on the border within eyesight, earsight, stone's throw from Tamaulipas, where, of course, the Setas 
uh, were born and, and operated and continue to operate in great, to a great extent. So she really has become the premier ec uh, expert on the setas uh, and, and had enormous contact with uh, people connected to and affected by the setas right there in Brownsville, Texas. Um, and then she is also president of the Association of Borderland Studies and author of a Department of State report on organized crime and trafficking in persons in Central America and along Mexico's eastern migration route. So we are delighted that she's here and she will make the opening remarks uh, on her book and help us uh, delve in, dig in deeper on that, on that topic. Next we'll hear from Stephen Dudley, co-director of Insight Crime, a joint initiative of the American University in Washington, D.C. and the foundation Insight Crime in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, Insight Crime monitors, analyzes, investigates organized crime in the American. And I suspect there's probably not anyone in this room, I, I could be mistaken, but probably not anyone in this room that doesn't know of Insight Crime and its excellent work. And probably everybody even knows Stephen Dudley. So we are delighted to have you here. Uh, he's a longtime investigative reporter uh, and, and uh, consultant. Just yesterday, he launched a, a, a study, and I have to confess I haven't read it yet because it just came out yesterday, but an extensive look into uh, uh, MS-13 and its presence in the region. Uh, the report is entitled MS-13 in the Americas, How the World's Most Notorious Gang Defies Logic and Resists Destruction. And I think MS-13 is probably one of those organizations that everybody talks about and very few people actually understand. So uh, Stephen and, and Insight Crime have done an excellent job uh, in that regard. And we also take credit for everything he does because he was a Wilson Center Fellow as well in 2012 and 2013. Next we'll hear from Nick Miroff, a national security correspondent at the Washington Post. Nick covers drug trafficking, international crime, immigration enforcement, and the Department of Homeland Security. He was a post correspondent in Latin America for 2010, from 2010 to 2017, based in Havana and Mexico City. He's written some terrific pieces uh, of late about uh, the Dreamers, DACA, uh, recip uh, DACA recipients, ICE and the Border Patrol, the, the Border Wall, uh, and he wrote a piece uh, last November that I called to your attention entitled Mexican Traffickers Making New York a Hub for Lucrative and Deadly Fentanyl. We have copies of it out on our table, and he will talk a bit about uh, his experience covering the setas, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. So thank you, Nick. And finally, and let me explain to you why I have asked uh, her to go last. It's not for anything else but the fact that she is a f one of the world's foremost experts, not only on organized crime in Mexico, but ex uh, organized crime and illicit markets around the world. Dr. Fel Vonda Felbaugh Brown is a senior fellow at the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence in the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings Institution. Um, I've known Vonda for a number of years now, uh, always uh, an intrepid traveler, investigator, n not one of these people that hides in her office and reads other people's work, really is out there on the field. When I reached, when I communicated with her last week, uh, she said hello from Nigeria. And she goes to Nigeria and Indonesia and Asia and Eastern Europe and really is on the ground. So not only does she provide us some perspective on Mexico, but really the whole uh, uh, broader global uh, view on illicit uh, economies and, uh, and uh, organized crime and how they uh, take advantage of it. So I think we have a stellar lineup. Let me be quiet. Uh, turn this over to Guadalupe, who will give us an overview on her excellent work on Los Setas, Inc. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you especially and everybody, all of my friends uh, here at the Wilson Center, a place that 
that I, I value and, 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 and appreciate a lot that has been part of my, of my development as a professional. I am I'm very grateful and I'm honored to be here. And I was honored to be here at the Latin American program um, last year. And, and I'm thankful uh, to the Mexico Institute, to the whole Woodrow Wilson Center for all the support, to all, for all my friends that are here. Uh, this is a very important moment for me because this is, this is the, the culmination, I mean, the, 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 the closing of a project that took me around seven years to complete. Uh, that was that was emotionally and 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 I was uh, I, it was difficult because it has some personal content to it, but but also um, uh, um, you know a, a human tragedy that we are that are looking at because of the of the birth of this criminal model that has really changed the face of organized crime in this hemisphere. I I was I was living in Brownsville, Texas, and I arrived there in the year two thousand and nine. When, I mean, some months before this so-called war between two big organizations that are so-called drug cartels took place and that started to burn half of the country. Today, we're looking at a very similar process uh, in the Pacific Coast with a group called um, El Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, also these armed wings that are militarized, and the militarization of organized crime uh, arrived with, with Los Zetas, and, and this business model that I would like to explain to you also came with Los Zetas. Los Zetas is not a, an organization that it's now in decline, that has now been divided, and we have seen these, these, these factions uh, happening here and there. They are part, Los Zetas I called in this book, Los Zetas Incorporated, it's a model. It's a new way to look at organized crime, to understand organized crime. Uh, I, will, I will not provide a lot of details about its formation, and this is not, as, as in the book I write, this is not a story about good and bad people, uh, narcos and drug lords and drug trafficking. This is, this is, this is a book about uh, transnational corporations, corporations that cross borders and that, that help each other or directly or indirectly benefit each other. This is a book about, uh, about enterprises, about economic entities that, that cross borders. And, uh, and the way that I see now this group, I started to study it from the, from the perspective of drug trafficking. And I found different elements here. And the last element that I found, the last two elements, I found people and I found energy. And I, will, I, I, will, I would like to, uh, to explain to you uh, very briefly what I found during these seven years. So this book is, it has three parts, and I'm not going to go into all of those, like the origins of the organization. We know that I was living in Brownsville. Uh, uh, on the other side, there was Matamoros, Tamaulipas. That's considered like the cradle or the birthplace of the Gulf Cartel, the Gulf Cartel that brought with it uh, and, and started this, this new model bringing with it um, an arm wing formed by special forces of the Mexican army. This model expanded and, and the, the, the configuration it took after years after arrest, uh, the, the arrest of the, of the main drug lord uh, or, or the main leader and, and how the configuration changed as soon as he was arrested then he was uh, in, in the year 2003 and in the year 2007 he was he was extradited to the United States and how they started to work and how they started to, to configure it themselves like companies like the when when Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel um, started to cooperate, but not one was part of the other one. They were called La Compañía, the company. And that's when we start, uh, we can start seeing its development uh, as, as, a, uh, as a transnational company and how they expanded and how they expanded their practices along the, the Tamaulipas border and they consolidated and were made strong in the city of Nuevo Laredo. And they started to oligopolize all the criminal activities that some point, at some point, were part only, I mean, they, they were, they were uh, concentrated or, or they, they, they were managed by different uh, criminal groups or, or mafias, and they started to oligopolize that in the city of Nuevo Laredo, and they exp exp expanded their, their, their reach to other parts of the border. This man was Osiel Cárdenas Guillén. He brought the Zetas, and this is La Compañía. Um, one element that was brought here was a militarization of, of criminal 
of, of criminal uh, organizations here. And this model, together with a marketing model and, and the utilization of technology, uh, formal media, and, and images that created terror, was, was a model that helped them expand and helped them to, to portray a perception that, that also called the, the Mexican state also called the response of the Mexican state, and that that really uh, form um, a face of of criminality and brutality that uh, that in the end uh, like benefited certain companies that I will explain later. Okay, so how how Los Etas uh, changed the the face of 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 criminal, um, I mean, the, the face of organized crime in Mexico, and I allege in, 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 a, in an important part of this Western Hemisphere, uh, the diversification of criminal activities, of course. Uh, this didn't start in, with the Zetas in Mexico. It started also in Colombia to a certain extent, but the, the consolidation of this model really started with the Zetas. So they started to diversify, and this is not only a drug trafficking group. We have read about this in several, in several outlets. This is, not, this is not a book that will explain that that explains it retakes all the, the works of others in this regard. And they started to dedicate themselves, and as, as I said, oligopolizing these other criminal activities, dedicate themselves, as, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, to migrant smuggling, to human trafficking, extortion, and the extraction of rents that are also part of like, the model of the gangs. Mm -hmm. this, 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 this new ways of, 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 of getting cash and, and doing this through the utilization of, of military strategies, military weapons, that, that really that really was a, a different thing. So they also uh, brought with them other other members of the special forces of the of the Mexican army, and also they they exported this model to different parts of Mexico. And I'm talking about La Familia Michoacana that started with a group also called La Empresa, the Enterprise in in Michoacan, and how like the La Familia Michoacana, uh, los Caballeros Templarios, los Rojos, los Ardillos, all these groups are at, at have adopted these, these, these uh, I mean, these practices, the military pra the tactics, and also the, the control of territory and, and, the, and the diversification of criminal activities. So in this book, uh, what I do is that I compare this model, not to the, 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 the typical model of a, of a franchise. Uh, they usually, like the, the, the previous people that try to understand this model, um, through like uh, utilizing a business model, they 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 utilize the model of franchise. I don't I, I, I don't look at them like that. I, I see corporate models and and the possibility to analyze this through business administration uh, literature, um, and I compare them to three to to, to three um, to, to three companies to three transnational companies in the energy sector and and and, the, and, and private security one would be the Exxon Mobil um, Exxon Mobil corporation and, and and its model I call a transnational corporation with multiple subsidiaries and when I uh, analyze the model of the set as I could see different subsidiaries uh, and holding companies and a very complex way of dealing with business it's not only it's not the tra tra traditional model that you have and this is this is something that has been because of the media that has been n not allowing us to understand what this is about. Trying to put like all the uh, our 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 eyes on a drug lord and the Zeta 40, the Zeta 42, Roberto Lascano. These these groups operate at different levels in different places with different activities, and it's not a franchise. They definitely uh, operate at different at different levels, and even. If today we don't see setas, we see a very similar mother operating in the Pacific. In, 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 in the Pacific. So, with regards to Exxon, I I do an analysis of how this this uh, this uh, model of subsidiaries, how the holding companies that where where these companies are able to have other companies that are not that are not necessarily related to to their to their activities, but that that, that help them diversifying risks financially. And this is what 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 Los Etas and and groups like that have done. Um, they, they have their holding companies to launder money, and we have seen this in horse racing uh, enterprises. We have seen this uh, in other ways that they, that they have used uh, in, in pharmaceutical companies, creating pharmaceutical companies. If you see different stories about how they launder money, this can be compared to, to how 
companies like the Zetas or like Halliburton or like uh, Walmart uh, are, are not only about what they do, but they, they diversify their, their financial activities and their risks this way. Uh, why I compare it to Halliburton? This, this company is very complex in many ways. Halliburton is not, uh, is not a, 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 a company, it's a company that provides services to the energy firms. So also the multiple holding companies and provides services to the oil firms. Well, Los Zetas, at, uh, they have been stealing hydrocarbons, stealing not only oil and gas, but also gas condensate that is utilized to, to produce other, other, other hydrocarbons. Uh, there, I mean, there are, there are specific cases, specific cases that can be proven by the information that it's, in, uh, that it's included in this, in this important uh, investigation by the United States, the Department of Justice, the DEA, the FBI. Um, they have, this is re the, the reckoning uh, uh, project where, where the, these companies and some of the heads of these companies were linked to, to operations that the Setas and the Gulf Cartel were selling cast condensate uh, through septon mechanisms crossing the border and ending up in important uh, companies like Shell and ConocoPhillips. There's a, there's a whole investigation and, and that, that, has been, that has been included in a book uh, by Ana Lilia Perez, uh, El Cartel Negro, and, and her research in, in Contra la Línea. And, and this, this, this research has been based on, on these on this, uh, lawsuits uh, the, of Pemex against mm -hmm. these companies. They never, they never finish, I mean, they didn't finish in, in favor of the company, but at the same time, we have seen that the, that the end uh, consumers of this, uh, of this uh, stolen uh, gas condensate and other derivatives, uh, other hydrocarbons, ended up in this, in this, with this, in these companies. We don't see a direct link or them directly buying uh, this from from the setas, but the, from, where they they bought these hydrocarbons from some intermediaries of the of the of, of this organization. So in that regard. Uh, a company like the Setas, and this is just like a like a like a link to these companies, uh, or, or or we can compare them to that. Another another very important uh, company that we that that we would like to that I that I utilize to explain the model, and I really went very deep into that, and and I tried to, to I mean to make a model similar to that. This this uh, I don't know if you have heard about uh, a company called. Constellis. Constellis is an umbrella of other companies that dedicate themselves to provide not only private security services, but other services to transport goods to make easier the communications uh, in the world. They have offices in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Kenya, in Nigeria, you know, in, in, in all these very complicated places. And I will explain you a little bit more about that. This company, uh, this company has in itself a company is called Academy. And what is Academy? Uh, Academy uh, is is like a company that today uh, has and changed its brand of what was at some point Blackwater. Blackwater changed its brand because of some uh, some uh, uh, like uh, unfortunate events that happened in in this recent um, uh, armed conflicts in the world, and therefore you know to change the the, the brand. Uh, they, they transform themselves into XE, they transform themselves into Academy, and now we don't really know where they are. But they are inside this, this, this umbrella of companies called Constellis LLC. Um, this is what they do. It's interesting to, to see who they are. Um, they, they include different companies now, Academy, Triple Canopy, Olive Group, Centerra, Omniplex, CD, a AMK9, the, the, dogs, um, the dogs that watch the borders. They provide a lot of services to, I mean, and they are contractors of, of private, uh, uh, private services, private security, Edinburgh International. It's very difficult to keep track of this, of this, of this company because uh, they, they restructure all the time. Uh, the, the book is just like very limited now because they have incorporated more companies. So it's very interesting to see how, for example, if we don't know anything about the Setas now, I mean, we can we can compare these to 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 a company like Constellis because there is a whole reconfiguration, uh, a very very different, um, uh, I mean, with a different name. So really, this is this is a this is a company that we that we can compare the Setas to. So this is this is the 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 business model of of Constellis Holdings, uh, with with the with the different companies that now. It has expanded. It it has it doesn't have like a like a head, but it has uh, a board of trustees, 
and, and, and a very complex financial and, and, and administrative and, 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 and managerial structure with different activities, uh, different subsidiaries, and also, also holding uh, companies. And so Los Etas also, we, we are not analyzing a company that's just led by one man. We have, for example, at, at, at some point, we had Setas that operated in Veracruz with a very different uh, leadership, with different activities, dedicating themselves, and, and not connecting one with the other one. And that does not mean that we are seeing a, a model like McDonald's, like a, like a franchise. This is what we are seeing, a, a company that, that incorporates uh, like, like, uh, like, like different subsidiaries, different, uh, different criminal activities. So if you read the book with more uh, detail, I, I explain how these two business models are really uh, comparable. And, and you know, there's something that I need to say, that this analysis does not suggest the causation intentionality, not, not our conspiracy by transnational energy and security companies with the aim of generating a chaotic situation in Mexico that would end up furthering their corporate interests. But any similarity between the CETAS model and these corporations is merely coincidental. Why, I mean, who benefits or potentially benefits from this model, from this violence, and from the reaction of the government against this model? Well, I also explain how corporate actors national financial companies and, fi and, and private security firms and the U.S. border security uh, industrial complex also benefited from, from the violence that was generated, from that perception of fear, but that, from, from, that, from that terror, really, uh, and directly or indirectly, these groups benefited from the CETAS model, and I call it a model. It's not like the CETAS. The cartel, the, the new generation, the cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, the Jalisco New Generation cartel, has the same dynamic, has, has, had, has very similar or, or origins. We had one important uh, group, a uh, drug trafficking organization, the Sinaloa cartel, that hired uh, some, some people that he helping them to fight the CETAS, the Bata CETAS, and today they are supposedly fighting for the control of the Pacific and, and important parts of the Pacific, particularly cities with ports with, uh, that of, of, of crucial and strategic infrastructure. So uh, what, what I also do is I, I, I present a series of maps that where I, where I was, when I was studying this as a criminal group, I started to, to map or to find where the places where they were, uh, where, where they, where they were concentrated concentrating their activities where the government reacted uh, were places that were rich in hydrocarbons or natural resources that were crucial from the production of energy. And I'm talking about water, water for fracking, like uh, the case of, uh, of Allende Coahuila is, 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 is fundamental in this regard. It's a place that has reservoirs of coal, reservoirs of, of course, uh, the, I mean the, the, the shale gas and shale oil, and also water. It has Allende, uh, Allende Coahuila, the zone of the Cinco Manantiales, uh, the, uh, the Five Springs. You have you have these elements for fracking in a place where, on the other side, you have uh, you have already equal for shale and a development uh, in, in, in you know, with regards to the production of shale. So we have we have all these and several uh, uh, people and 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 for example, with regards to the to the Chihuahua Basin and El Valle de Juarez, uh, two journalists. Uh, Ignacio Alvarado and and uh, and, and, and another for, uh, photojournalist. They covered how, like the Valley of Juarez, is a place where you have also hydro reaching hydrocarbons. So uh, these 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 places, and also in the in the Pacific, we can find uh, that places where the setas and and the and the and, and the, the extreme violence that they generated were were places rich in these resources. Also, like the construction of of new uh, pipe pipelines happened and uh, at the same time when we were experiencing en enormous levels of violence and the creation of infra uh, uh, strategic infrastructure uh, the road um, um, the road uh, from Sinaloa to Matamoros was constructed in in a period that you would have not imagined because of the important uh, levels of violence but the the generation of strategic infrastructure related to the energy sector and the concentration of violence in places where you have 
about natural resources, water, uh, iron ore, for example, in the case of um, in the case of, uh, of Michoacan, the the book tells you very very with detail what happened in Coahuila, what happened in Michoacan with this same model. I'm talking about the setas in Coahuila, how they were involved in the coal business, how they could be involved, uh, uh, or or the how how could they be involved in other activities, how they were involved in extraction of iron ore that they were supposedly selling to China, and how from China they 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 send uh, some some of the of the of the resources to produce to produce some drugs. So this 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 model that that operated not only in in Tamaulipas in 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 Veracruz, but it's the same. It follows the same logic, and 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 in a very in interesting way. I, I observed like that that this this model uh, coincided with the with the um, with the with these reservoirs and the existence of, of these natural resources that in the end would be uh, would be utilized to produce energy um, and not only not only natural gas and oil that was just like a, a coincidence I, I I cannot allege any uh, causation any any intentionality. But but that's 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 how how I, I started to tra to track uh, violence and and today the logics of Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación the interesting thing is that that they that they are also concentrated in parts where you have either um, uh, Pemex. Uh, and Pemex infrastructure, so they still are stealing the oil in the Pacific, or they are uh, trying to to get control of areas that are near the ports, very important ports. I'm, I'm talking about um, Nayarit. I'm talking about um, Sinaloa and 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 Guerrero and Oaxaca. We're, we're talking about uh, Los Rojos, Los Ardillos, and and like all gold in, in in a very important part of of, of Guerrero. And I'm I am just like you know this is this is the the last slide of of the book. Uh, where, where where we do uh, this this um, this connection, and who benefits from this, or who will potentially benefit from this? There is a there's a I mean there are people that have written about about this, and how like you know, how the militarization of organized crime, together with the response yeah. of the government, yeah. displace people from their land, and in 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 the end this lowers the price of the land or makes it makes it uh, easier for them to, to sell their lands when, when it's, it's in the secondary legislation of Mexico that, that because of this is, is of national interest, it's a matter of national interest, the imminent domain, it, to, to some extent, make some, some similarity of what happens. Uh, people have to sell or to rent their lands anyway because uh, uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a primary activity that needs to be developed in Mexico. So when you haven't lived in your land for a while, even though it is still yours, some of these lands, we, we, we still need to see like the, like the, the results of the new uh, ag agricultural census, El Centro Agropecuario, the, the, the new one, and, and probably the next one in, in, in 2027, we'll, we'll probably see if these titles have, have changed their hands. At this point, we don't know about that, but it's interesting to see how the connection is, is really, really close of where, of where natural resources that are important for the production of energy are connected to spaces of, of, high, uh, criminal, uh, of high criminality and extreme levels of violence where, where, where the militarization of security and the militarization of organized crime have, have been combined. So it's just like, a, like, a, like the beginning of, of, of further uh, research projects where, where, we can, where we can see more things than, than that bad people, drug lords, uh, uh, fighting for plazas. And, and I believe that what we are observing now in the Pacific should be looked with different eyes, not like the the kids of the Chapo or Guzman are fighting with El the people of El Mencho, and and this is really not what it's at 
at, at, I mean, at, at stake today. Um, private security companies will be coming to places of, of extreme levels of violence like Tamaulipas, bringing uh, with them private security, and that would also uh, boost uh, an industry uh, that, that would benefit companies like Constellis. And, and how these businesses get together are not, uh, are not necessarily the same, but they are linked and they benefit each other. And how to see violence with different eyes and who benefits from the violence, more than, than, than see these as just a matter of bad people uh, that are affecting you know, bad people. It's, it's, it, that is why uh, this book is called Loseta Singh. Thank you for, for, for being here. And thank you for all my friends and the Wilson Center for, for, for giving. Thank you, Eric, for organizing this. Thank you. <clears throat> all right, there are some seats up front here, so don't be shy. Come up and take a, a couple seats. Um, I don't know if you heard the drilling. I couldn't tell if it was just in my ear or what, but. <laughs> I'm told that it's from our neighbors, CBP. I don't know if that means they're <laughs> plugging a tunnel or they're trying to build a tunnel into the Wilson Center, but there's nothing we can do about uh, controlling the drilling sound. So anyway, thank you, Guadalupe. I mean, two big takeaways here is that we need to think about organizational model as a big, uh, you know, a, a difference. Uh, not that the, the top-down sort of pyramid structure is, is really important to understand that, and also this strong connection to other elements of illegal economies, and especially uh, natural resources and uh, uh, energy extraction and so on. So thank you very much. We're going to turn now to Stephen Dudley. Uh, Co-director of the Inside Crime has covered organized crime in Mexico and Central America, Colombia, uh, almost everywhere uh, in <laughs> yeah. the Americas. So thank you, in Stephen. Americas, yeah. huh? In the Americas. Right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Th Go ahead. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for the Wilson Center. Good morning to everybody. I um, uh, had a great time here as a Wilson Fellow, so I really appreciate that and appreciate getting invited back anytime. Uh, first couple words about Guadalupe's tremendous book. It's uh, uh, without a doubt groundbreaking in terms of our understanding of the setas. Um, probably the thing that, that most struck me, just because I've, I've lived and worked in Colombia for so long, is uh, this idea of the connection between organized crime, or, or in this case, uh, this uh, you know sort of diversified uh, criminal portfolio that this criminal group had, and and multinational companies. Um, you know what we saw in Colombia was a very uh, clear connection. And in fact, uh, in a lot of interviews that I did with paramilitaries, they would talk specifically about these clear connections that they had and these relationships they had. So to begin to explore that aspect in Mexico is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and especially going forward as we get more sophisticated groups emerging like the uh, Carta de Jalisco. Um, so thank you very much for that, Guadalupe. It's tremendous. It's also a tremendous honor to be here with Nick, uh, who I don't know, but I obviously follow his work tremendously. And then Vanda, who's like, uh, I don't know, she's kind of the Brazilian soccer star of our industry. She just, <laughs> just goes by Vanda. Just one single name. Um, the, the, the other day, I would just... Um, um, in the news, we, we found that there was a, a set the 43, you guys probably forgot they even numbered themselves at this stage, uh, was, was captured, this guy named Jose Maria Guizar Valencia, which uh, obviously provoked a little bit of thought, um, not the least of which because he was captured in Mexico City, not exactly a bastion of, of set the activity. And um, one of the you know, best articles that came out of that was uh, from our good friend Alejandro Ope, um, Ope is, uh, he, I should also say he's a board member of Insight Crime and uh, has great amount of influence over us. Um, and he is um, obviously very adept at breaking these things down. One of the things he said was um, the setas were a victim of their own success. He broke down a little bit why they had broken down. And I thought in the ways that we could, in the way that Guadalupe had looked at these, like a company, maybe we could do a little bit of the same as it relates to the setas, you know, analyze why, why did this thing break down? Because at the end of the day, they're a very fragmented, disintegrated organization. Um, I guess for me then that, that story brings us to uh, this guy's brother, who we followed very closely um, going back to 2010, I started following this guy his brother, who went by the name um, Sita 
200. Um, I'm not sure if that was, um, you know, just because he liked the number 200 or not, but uh, not very clear. But it was interesting just to see kind of how they, they operated. He operated out of Guatemala. <coughs> and I would say first and foremost with the setas, when we were breaking down the model, what, we, what was most important um, as we looked at them was their notion of territory, their control of territory. That was the first uh, thing that they, that they sought. They were, in essence, a military organization. had come with military roots, so their notion of how to deal with crime was, we're going to control territory. Um, this is different from controlling the actual aspects of the criminal operations themselves, and this is the fundamental thing, I think, with the CITAS, is that their operations were never geared towards controlling all of the different aspects of these criminal operations. They were first, they, they said, we're going to control territory from the territory we're going to control uh, and extract rents from these particular activities, legal and illegal, that are happening within these territories. The, the, the evolution of this is probably worth going into just because it's a bit like the evolution of crime in, in Mexico itself. You know, you start out with these smaller, simple criminal groups, family structures, and the like, very sort of basic structures. They get a little bit more complex. They have different levels. There are different lieutenants. They have different uh, types of jobs. They have different types of loyalties, maybe necessar not necessarily family loyalties, but in the case of the setas, military loyalties, trying to create a sort of ethos that is based around some idea of collective identity. But as they get more and more stretched out, of course, you get a different, different structure and a more complex structure and a structure that is harder and harder to control. So this is your structure that can control territory because they're very sophisticated, extended. They can control territory extending to, you know, all the way to Guatemala. Um, but this is, a, this is a structure that's also very hard to control. This is a structure that has very difficult time uh, keeping its, its, uh, its own lieutenants in check. And part of that also has to do with the fact that they had to figure out how to pay for this structure. And in figuring out how to pay for this structure, they diversified their criminal portfolio. And in diversifying their criminal portfolio, they had to give more access to their lieutenants to those revenue streams. In other words, I have to figure out how to pay my soldiers. How am I going to pay my soldiers? Well, I'll let them control more of the income streams, the, in the revenue streams from the lower echelons of my organization. I'm not going to let them get involved in the drug trafficking side because that's where the big money is. But I'll let them get involved in the extortion, the kidnapping, other rent-seeking rent opportunities that they have in, within their purview, uh, theft and resale, contraband, all of these things. I'll let them do that. They can control that. They can get that money. What does that do, though? That creates pressure on the model to stay as one single unit. And this is why you start to get the, the fragmentation of the organization. The organization fragments. It's not necessarily a victim of its own success. Its success comes from the fact that it has this flexi flexible model. But it's a victim of its own model. Um, it gives an opportunity for all these people to be involved in these things. And these things, and this is very important from a business perspective, have incredibly low barriers of entry. And when they have low barriers of entry, then it's easier for uh, ma many of them to get involved and maintain control over these sorts of activities. Drug trafficking, international drug trafficking, is a very high barrier of entry. You need a lot of different contacts, a lot of different ways to move things, um, a lot of infrastructure. Uh, in place. You need a lot of different things that on the lowest levels these guys aren't going to have. But extortion, and especially after years of building up their organization, um, you know, is, has a very low barrier of entry. They already have the, the weapons. They have some training. They're an organization that controls territory. So how do you control that? You can't. So this is what starts to spin out of control, and this is what you start to say. This is where the model goes wrong, Okay, and then you have other opportunities of these other organizations, like we were mentioning the Carta de Jalisco, uh, of, of how it could go perhaps in a different direction. I just put this slide up just really quickly just to show that it wasn't just Guatemala that they had this model. They used this model in all different types of places. We also did a lot of work on Monterey. We did a lot of work on Nuevo Laredo. Nuevo Laredo was a different type of model in terms of the setas because they were controlling drug trafficking there. And so that's it, a lot of it was centered on the control of drug trafficking and controlling 
that particular criminal activity. But in other spaces where they expanded and where they were able to expand, they controlled these low-level criminal activities. Their revenue streams are local in nature, and this is also important. They are not depending on this international drug trafficking revenue stream. So this gives them the opportunity to expand, but it also puts pressure on their model, and eventually this cracks at the seams. So if we were going to compare this to the Cartel de Jalisco, and, and I have to say on the onset, I'm not, I'm not the expert on, on Cartel. I've done a lot less work on the Cartel de Jalisco. Uh, I find it fascinating um, uh, for a number of reasons, because they seem to be, in a way, kind of learning from this, um, these failures of the Zetas, and trying to account for those failures. Um, in, in what way? Well, well first of all, they, they, the, the Mata Setas, which appeared in 2011 in, in, um, in, um, I'm playing, in Veracruz, um, it, was, it was pretty clear uh, from the people that we talked to that they, these guys were all military, at least ex and probably ex and current military in the Mata Setas. And that, for us, is, is the, the beginning core of, of the Cartel de Jalisco. It's this ex current military structure. Um, so in that way, yes, very similar. Um, an effort to control territory, yes, uh, absolutely, uh, very similar in that regard, the, the need to control territory. But then, but then they start to diverge a little bit. Uh, they seem to be, uh, for example, unlike the Setas who really wanted to monopolize control of that territory and all those, all those revenue streams, they seem to be a little bit more flexible, a little bit more accommodating. With, uh, with the local groups. They're willing to work with local groups as opposed to the setas who just wanted to displace them, get rid of them completely, um, which is what we saw consistently as the way that, uh, in the way that the setas operated. Um, they seem to be not just espousing this idea of protection of, of the local community, uh, of social protection, of this protection of those who live within their spaces of operation, but actually carrying out to some extent that promise um, that is very different from the setas who came in with a very predatory notion of, of extracting rents from just about everybody in their territory. And probably the, the, maybe the more interesting thing, and this is something that's very hard to get at, but is this idea of recruiting. Over time, the, the setas uh, were, were recruiting more, as they expanded, of course, they needed more soldiers, um, but they couldn't necessarily recruit all the, literally the soldiers that they needed because they initially started with this idea of soldiers, or recruiting more and more from local street gangs and others. Uh, we haven't seen that yet necessarily from the, the Carta de Jalisco. In fact, their whole notion of to be more flexible and accommodating doesn't, means that they don't have to rely on that local labor force to be incorporated into their networks, into their, um, into their organizations. They can have a sort of relationship which still allows them to control territory, um, but doesn't force them to incorporate that low, those human resources, if you will, speaking like a company, that are not necessarily the types of human resources you want within your, your organization. So these are just a, a few of the different things um, that we look at when we look at the setas in the, in the Carta de Jalisco and just, and just comparing them. And again, sort of taking a step back, like Guadalupe was talking about, taking a step back and, and, and saying, you know, th these, these organizations, you know, are operating and, and need these sorts of things um, and, and are operating with this idea of, you know, on the one hand, you have the setas, which is obviously going after territory, very predatory, and is seeking a monopoly. Um, they want absolute and total social control, and their criminal activities have very low barriers of entry, um, and their recruiting tactics are obviously uh, lacking because they bring in people that are unsophisticated and uh, also not very um, uh, loyal to their organization. The Carta de Jalisco also wanting territory, but much more flexible and accommodating um, they're seeking or, or trying to promote this idea of social protection in more instances than, than the setas carrying out this promise. Um, their, their activities amongst their upper echelon, very high barriers of entry, so they're not allowing just anybody inside those circles, and then their recruiting tactics are slightly different. So with that, I'll just end it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Um, 
it, you know, what comes to mind as you talk about some of this is this, uh, what we talk about in the military too of clear, hold, and build. You know, they, they said this kind of cleared out everybody, held it, controlled it, and then built their their un criminal enterprise. One of the things that struck me in a visit to the border with Guadalupe and talking to people about the setas is they had a clear business model, but were rotten entrepreneurs, is w which I think is what you were telling us. You know, they extorted local businesses out of business. You know. You'd think they'd want to encourage the business so they could get more money uh, out of it, and they just destroyed local businesses in places like I think we were in, in, in Reynosa at the time. So, you know, kind of a sophisticated business model, but crummy entrepreneurs when it got right down to it, which is an irony. Let's turn now to Nick. Nick, it's uh, I, I, I can't imagine what it must be like to try to cover the setas uh, for a, a daily newspaper. So. I'm anxious to hear about that experience and, and also your thoughts on uh, not just the Setas, but Sinaloa and how they build these business uh, enterprises, uh, empires, I'm sorry, uh, across borders. So go ahead, Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, thank you to the Wilson Center. It's great to be with all of you guys. What a great book, Guadalupe. Congratulations. And uh, Stephen and Vonda, it's great to see you guys. It's it's uh, great to not be covering the Zetas in Mexico <laughs> anymore. I'll, I just came back to Washington about six months ago, um, as Eric said, after seven years in Latin America. Um, and when I started out in 2010 um, in, in Mexico City, it was really the height of, um, of you know, uh, really, of, of, uh, it was the beginning of a, of a, of a period of, of extreme drug violence. Um, and, and the way I think about it in some ways is, you know, that was when both La Familia Michoacana and the Zetas were really like an open confrontation with the state. Um, and uh, there was, uh, I think, you know, they in some ways poked the bear a little, a little too much. They, they made themselves targets uh, for the sort of full weight of the Mexican state in, in cooperation with, with, with Washington and the United States. Um, and those years were really marked for me as a reporter um, trying to tell that story by a series of really spectacular incidents of violence. Um, I, I, was, I remember going, uh, the first time I, I went to Nuevo Laredo was after the Zetas um, drove a couple school buses up to the state prison and made off with uh, 150 inmates. And uh, I remember going going up there and um, interviewing the new security chief uh, um, and the new prison director uh, for that story. And within three weeks, both of them were dead. And uh, it was it was remarkable to be in a in a place like that w w that was completely consumed with fear, and and completely dominated by um, a criminal organization. And from then on, you know, any time. There was a story in Nuevo Laredo that was like the place that you dreaded having to go more than anywhere else, and 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 really that was that was true um, in all of the areas where the Zetas operated. There was this there was this unpredictability about them. There was this um, you know there was this uh, this sense that that they didn't respect the old rules. And you really saw that when you talked, you, you know, when you when you would meet people on the ground, and, and and they would tell you about, you know, the way they viewed the dominant criminal organization in their area. Obviously, if you went to Sinaloa or Tino, or Tijuana or that, the western border, um, you know, you still you still found people who uh, felt like you know that that the criminal organization, the Chapo, and the Sinaloa cartel. Um, were were predictable and that they understood the rules of the game and how to live with under within them, and you never you never saw that in Tamaulipas. You just saw sheer terror, you know, and that was true in Veracruz and and all the way down to Guatemala, and and it, it really you know over those years it got got me thinking you know what what happened to the Zetas after you know after you know you had the massacre of the migrants you had the the seventy two migrants you had the the uh, casino bombing, the fire bombing, um, we, we covered that too. They killed 52 people there. And then, um, and then to me, the remains the more, sort of the most horrible thing that I've ever had to cover was when um, they were like taken outside San Fernando where they, where they had massacred the migrants only, I don't know, nine months earlier. They were stopping buses and taking 
people, uh, young men, um, but almost anyone off of these buses and taking them out to these remote ranches and murdering them really for no reason. Um, and I'll never forget having to, you know, driving that highway, going up there, going to the morgue in Matamoros and seeing these, um, you know, these campesinos that had come up like from Oaxaca and, uh, and Jalisco and they were looking for their, their children and they were they were at the morgue and asking you know you know what did you find what did you find because their children had gone you know headed up to the border um, to cross over to go to work and they never heard from them again and that you know th so so covering the setas and their their style of violence in those years was something I'll I'll never forget and you know um, but it it also got me thinking where did they go wrong and I think you know ultimately they were they were very good at violence but they were bad at politics. And you need you need to you know in, in, in this being Mexico you need to you need to combine your your business model with a, a dose of successful politics, and uh, they made themselves a public enemy from the beginning, and it made it easier for the Mexican state, which was facing this kind of existential threat, um, at a time when it was it was seeking to change its image abroad, at a time when it was seeking to, um, you know, enter the OECD and and uh, embark on an energy reform later. You know that the, the, that this idea that you would have an organization that was so out of control that it was that it was you know completely undermining and and as we know a, a group like Sinaloa undermines the rule of law in some ways and in much more insidious ways by systematic corruption and bribery and um, and influence peddling and really penetrating the the political system but this was this was too uh, frontal for the for the Mexican state and and that's I think why the the state was ultimately burned out. Um, and and broke up, and so it was fascinating to see Stephen your your uh, comparison to the to you know to the Jalisco organization, what they've learned and how they're how they're different. Although we have seen similar uh, willingness to confront the government, that um, I think in the long run is you know never never going to work. Um, and uh, so now um, back here in 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 the United States, um, I'm trying to cover uh, drug trafficking networks. Here and understand the the degree to which Mexican um, trafficking organizations have penetrated um, American communities and are and are controlling retail drug trafficking um, both on the wholesale level and and in some cities a retail level and I think this is one of the kind of you know uh, untold stories or or one of the things that you know even the DEA uh, folks are still getting um, a handle on. Um, we have an administration that is so determined to, to make MS-13 into a boogeyman um, for, I think, m you know, other reasons of political expediency. But uh, meanwhile, we're seeing things like, um, you know, the, the, what we found in, in New York uh, last fall, where um, uh, Mexican traffickers are moving massive amounts of fentanyl um, through the New York area, um, using New York as a distribution hub, and uh, and we're seeing you know record overdoses um, related to fentanyl all across the the northeast and parts of the United States, and the DEA is making record seizures of fentanyl in these places, and the thing that is so striking um, that was uh, so astounding to me is they they've been arresting um, suspects with ties to Sinaloa, especially. Um, and you know, with huge amounts of fentanyl in their possession, and they don't even have weapons. They're 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 middle-aged, um, completely nondescript, um, uh, you know, Mexican nationals who go up there specifically to preside over a, a large wholesale, wholesale transaction. And um, it's a completely different business model that is unlike the way that you know the Colombians operated in Miami and New York in the 80s and 90s when when they generated so much violence and tried to take over territory again. And um, and so I I wonder I mean I I I see the the Sinaloa model of not trying to attract uh, unnecessary attention to yourself, of bribing um, and and steadily kind of undermining the rule of law where you operate. Um, uh, to minimize violence and to not you to not rely on the spectacular application of violence the way that the Zetas did, I think in some ways that that trafficking model and, and the Sinaloans have really you know they already practiced that but they really learned and and that and that this whole that episode for under Calderon of the the confrontation between Michoacan and and the Zetas and the Mexican state um, 
even though Chapo has been taken down, his his organization has proven to be far more resilient, and um, will will likely be more of a long term threat to Mexico. So, um, thanks again for for having me here. Thank you, Nick. And I think uh, your work has reminded me that these criminal organizations don't sort of disappear once they cross the Rio Grande. They actually are very well organized and operate very in a very sophisticated way here in the United States. And sometimes we focus so much on south of the border, we forget what's going on in our own country. Thank you. Uh, let's turn finally, because of her great wisdom and knowledge and global reach, to Vonda Feldbaugh-Brown. Um, I have about 20 questions to ask you, Vonda, but I'm going to let you go first, and then I'll ask my questions, because you'll probably cover them in your presentation. Well, um, thank you very much. I'm delighted to uh, see everyone in the room, and uh, I'm delighted that you uh, have come to listen to uh, Guadalupe. Uh, and I am sure that you will leave buying the book. It's not enough coming here. You must buy the book. It's a <laughs> groundbreaking uh, book, and I think that um, what both um, Nick and uh, Steve said about, and, and Eric, about the originality of focusing on the business model uh, is very important contribution, and so do not leave without buying the book. <laughs> now, I, I want to pick up um, uh, with um, uh, Nick's comments and very much endorse um, you know, his sense that I like very much that uh, the Zetas were too frontal, and I would say they were also too frontal and too unanchored. Essentially, what any militant or, for that matter, criminal group or even a, a, a protostate entity needs to resolve in how uh, ruling a territory is what kind of combination of brutality and legitimacy it will, uh, uh, it will seek to uh, present in its strategy. And uh, so to me, the, the far more fundamental difference really is not between uh, the Jalisco Nueva Generacion and the Zetas, uh, whom I see quite one of the kind, though, with the differences that uh, Steve pointed to. But it's really between them and Sinaloa, and for that matter, between them and La Familia Michoacana. The choice that the Zetas made was to rule through brutality alone simply be tougher than anyone else on the block. Militant groups uh, have that same choice. Uh, Eric mentioned that I was in Nigeria, I was in the Borno State, which is the area of a group you might have heard of, Boko Haram, a very vicious group, that uh, also was facing this decision in um, joining the global jihad and rebelling against the government being quite uh, very successful and coming to control very vast territories for a while, uh, really um, putting the Nigerian state under tremendous pressure and really putting it on the run, very rapidly coming to rule uh, a territory. But now that you find yourself ruling the territory, how are you going to go about it? Well, uh, you have a choice to be simply brutal, to simply engage in predation without having a political state-building project, essentially what the Boko Haram did. This was the model of the Zetas. I was uh, once in uh, Michoacan, um, part of Tierra Caliente, uh, in, in a small city, in a small town, which I won't name, and I was told that when the Zetas arrived, they're trying to wrestle the town away from um, Millennium uh, Cartel. They rounded up um, all the pimps and local drug dealers and the prostitutes uh, killed in front of people, select number of them, and uh, those that they found more disobedient and said, well, from this moment on, no one operates any kind of activity in town without either paying to us or having our permission, and eventually they tried to get rid of them. But they didn't do anything else. In contrast to groups like Familia Michoacana, which set up courts, and later on the Templarios, that uh, were dealing um, uh, that were dealing not just in drugs, they were dealing in dispute resolutions, they were handing out rules and orders. They were filling in the function of the state that was not present or that was too corrupt in large parts of um, the territory. The Sinaloa cartel, similarly, they were not only much more restrained and violent, even though at the end of the day, lots of the fighting started with the aggression of Chapo in, in various territories and incursion of Chapo trying to take over markets that had belonged to other groups, the violence was still uh, much more restrained and was calibrated 
uh, both um, against the other groups, also was calibrated vis-a-vis -vis the state, and crucially was accompanied by other functions, proto-state-like functions, to, to generate political capital. From the very s simplest ones of simply handing out money to local Catholic churches, handing out money to build uh, local soccer fields, uh, to sponsor fiestas, to again being more sophisticated in controlling this order and, and, deliv and delivering some form of rule and governance. You know, Eric, uh, I think it was Eric who spoke about the um, stupidity of the Zetas of extorting businesses uh, out of their own business. You know, it was another set of interviews I did in um, Tijuana. I, in this case, it was not against the Zetas, it was against the other group. But what was fascinating was people said, look, we loved when Sinaloa finally managed to win. We pay, I said, why, you know, do you no longer have to pay extortion to them? And they said, oh, no, we pay extortion. But it's at a very reasonable rate, it's predictable, it's stable, and they're great. They're keeping the health inspectors away from the <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> and the health inspectors, they are a major nuisance because we also have to pay bribes to them, and the bribes so that we get the health certificates are lower, uh, are higher than what we have to pay the Sinaloa. Whereas when there was infighting before Sinaloa won, we had to pay to multiple groups and often they were asking very unreasonable prices and it was not clear to whom we won. So, um, you know, the, the choices that the groups like uh, Jalisco Nueva Generación, like the Zetas make, is the same fundamental choice that, that uh, uh, territorially based um, insurgent groups make. I spoke of the very stupid model of Boko Haram, which uh, has suffered severe um, defeats at the hands of the state. It still exists, it's still powerful. But their, big, their biggest um, uh, threat has actually come from the emergence of an Islamic state in northern Nigeria, actually a group that has split off from Boko Haram, and that specifically reacts to the uh, predation uh, without restraint, to the brutality, without services, to the indiscriminate violence. And the, the Islamic State in northern Nigeria is trying to build political capital. They're trying to, being very discriminate in who they go after, going after government targets and, uh, and uh, military targets, not uh, blowing up uh, mosques, and also trying to minimize particularly casualties to Muslim populations. Another contrast, and very good contrast, is, is the Taliban. That is the reason we are still today talking about the Taliban years into counterinsurgency efforts against the group. The, uh, and the, the, their principal um, success is not only being able to invest systematically in governance that's brutal, but nonetheless predictable, often preferable to governance associated with the government, but also in their capacity to regulate brutality. They often overreach, but when they get feelers from the population that the brutality is too much, they pull back. And they engage in visible uh, punishment and restraint of their commanders who are, too, who are too brutal. So the investment is not just in being tougher than anyone else. It's in fact not in being tougher, but rather in being tough, but with limits, and in, in building in legitimacy. You know, that said, I think a, a very fundamental problem, nonetheless, in Mexico is that we see the, the emergence of uh, Jalisco Nueva Generación. And it's a very fundamental problem, though, because although the Zetas stepped onto the bear, or I should say bears, they, they alienated everyone, not just the state. They provoked, they overstretched, and they provoked fighting with everyone, everywhere, essentially. They... they uh, that, that overstretch their hubris also led them to being um, very indiscriminate in making enemies among criminal groups, is that um, the, the Mexican state has failed in sending the message that unrestrained violence, unrestrained aggression doesn't pain, that it will generate the, the state crushing it. And even though the Mexican state tried doing so with uh, La Familia Michoacana and with the Zetas, the message has not spread. And uh, the Jalisco Nueva Generación still believes they can behave essentially in ways that are very analogous, though slightly more nuanced, um, than the Zetas. And, and that's where policy uh, 
uh, really needs to move forward to very much stressing to uh, criminal groups that profit is not the end all be all, that risk minimization needs to be a crucial aspect. And those who are too aggressive, too violent, who don't moderate risk will be crushed. So what the state really should try to do with transactional uh, uh, goods, with, with transactional illicit activities to which the, there is no end is to uh, essentially make a good criminals, to decide what are the most intolerable activities that need to be deterred. And the Mexican state has so far critically failed in that. Which then leads me to uh, one of the things that Eric was asking me, the comparisons to, um, to other criminal markets and other parts of the world. One of the things that really stands out about Mexico, um, and I would say Latin America more broadly, is just the level of violence in criminal markets. If you look at uh, drug trafficking in East Asia, it is as extensive in the level of production, it is ex extensive in the level of trafficking, and it is probably larger in terms of consumption than what we see in Latin America. But it is very peaceful. In most of East Asia, um, Southeast Asia, if I s take out places like Myanmar where drug trafficking and, and drug cultivation are of course, uh, of course intimately uh, intertwined with ethnic civil war, we are talking about murder rates on the order of one per 100,000, under really bad circumstances, two per 100,000. We're talking an order or two orders of magnitude difference uh, than in Latin America. And it's not just about drug trafficking. All manner of criminality is both less prevalent often, but also not violent. If you end up in a robbery situation in Rio or Sao Paulo, you are very lucky if you walk away from it alive. The odds that just straightforward robbery will escalate into a very brutal encounter is enormously high in Latin America. If you, first of all, the odds of being mugged in Thailand or China are not particular, or Malaysia are not particularly high, but if they happen, you will walk away from it and you will probably not be beat up in any way. So when we look at all kinds of criminality, it's just so much more violent in Latin America. And, and Mexico itself, the, the current um, slaughter uh, is um, excruciating. It should be intolerable for the state. It, it's the primary focus that needs to happen is to bring the violence down. And again, it's very atypical uh, by criminal markets. You know, I was struck then and give lots of credit to Guadalupe in daring to use the word civil war in Mexico. That's uh, politically incorrect for many people in Mexico to do so, but it is very appropriate because the violence level that we are seeing there, 200 people, 200,000 people dead since uh, <coughs> 2006, roughly, it's more intense than many a civil war. It's more deaths per year than what we see in places like Afghanistan and Iraq frequently. And um, that is not a factor of the criminal illicit economy itself. It's not a factor of drug trafficking itself. It's a sign of crime market out of control where unrestrained aggression is still not sufficiently deterred. And so one of the things that I hope that not just all of you in the room, but policymakers will read Guadalupe's book for, is to think about how to switch the business model into making good criminals. It's bad that they want to peddle with drugs. You want to discourage that. But it must become unacceptable that they do so through the violence level that, with which they believe they can not only get away with it, but worse, uh, accomplish their mission. <coughs> Thank you, Vonda. Um, thank you all for your comments. We have some time now for questions from the audience. Uh, and so I'll turn to you in just a minute. I don't know if Guadalupe, you want to say anything? You were you led off and we all talked about your work and I don't know if there's anything you want to add here or just should we go to the questions? Well, just one, um, was just one last comment by listening uh, to my colleagues. Um, I have some questions myself about why this started to happen the way it happened. 
And these enigmas that, that I don't understand. The, the setas were the, I mean, were guilty of its own success, right? Uh, how Alejandro Hoppe said that, that they were guilty or they were <laughs> victims of their own success. Yeah. Um, but it seemed to me, uh, I mean, to some extent, of course I understand, the, and, 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 and what Banda was saying, the differences, but the similarities between these groups. But why the setas, when they started, they even made use of the media to portray their own violence, to generate their brand, like Steve, uh, uh, I mean, Steve wrote about that. But it was like intentional. To some extent, they were, I mean, you don't do it when you are a, a, like a drug trafficker. You don't want the state to look at you. You don't, I mean, they were pioneers by utilizing the narco banners, the, the videos, like, you know, executions in videos, like calling, uh, I mean, to, uh, I mean, to be, uh, I mean, to be, to be attacked, uh, you know, it's like, I am threatening the state. Yes, they're, they're, I mean, the state, um, and here is where, uh, also the utilization of failed states, it's just sometimes not considered very, very, very appropriate, like the utilization of civil wars or terrorism or narco-terrorism because it has other implications. But anyway, uh, why, I mean, why you do this? Why, why you start your model? Why you start your approach to the society by, you know, cutting heads and presenting them in the media? And then an appearance of all these blogs, uh, and I followed them very closely the first years when I was doing this research, like the brutality, the blood that was presenting. It was not only about them, but the media, how the media reacted to this model. And, and the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, it's, 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 a, it's, it's another, and that's why, you know, utilizing business um, literature to understand what's happening might be useful. I mean, why Blackwater? We don't know about it. They still are doing business, and, but they, they, they kind of changed their methods, but, but this method seemed to be uh, intentional. At, at the beginning, and that caused something at the moment where where there was, and this is what other critics like Don Paley in Drug War Capitalism does. She's very critical, and to some extent, um, you know, so critical of the of the cooperation, the anti drug trafficking cooperation, and 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 the prog anti anti narcotics programs like CARSI, like Merida Initiative of Plan Colombia. How the militarization of security, the approach to these models, like through through military tactics because of because of the fact that there's no other way to do that but the generation of spaces of violence of civil war because it's a civil war in many ways and if you utilize the new civil war theory to understand what happened in Mexico you might you might find that these are not wars of uh, ideological wars but they are economic wars and we see that in many spaces in Colombia in Afghanistan and I mean in the Middle East we, we see the I, I mean the Islamic State also some of the similarities like like banda was 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 talking about Boko Haram, but but why? I mean, why why the setas are, are, are because they were stupid since the beginning. But this was this was this was something, and this is probably their own mistake and their own problem. But it seemed to me structural. The violence seemed to be uh, to be organized in a way that I cannot explain. Maybe it can be. A, uh, I mean, it's not it's not a, a conspiracy theory, but it's a it's a question, and, and we might want to make this question, why they, in the beginning, utilize this way to build their brand because it was going to destroy them in the end. So you start by destroying yourself. I don't think that that, that, was, that was done intentionally that way, but, but just, you know, I just wanted to open that question. All right, thank you. We're going to turn to some questions now. I wanted to just recognize a couple of people, Sharon, going up from... Uh, who has been here as a Wilson Center Fellow for a couple of years, I think, uh, worked a lot on the issue of wildlife trafficking and organized crime. So uh, thank you for being with us. And uh, others uh, from our team, Cindy Arnson, Director of the, War the Latin America Program, and, and I'm actually surprised to see Andrew Seeley here, uh, former Executive Director of the Wilson Center and now President of the Migration Policy Institute. That either means you settled everything in the Senate and DACA's taken care of, or you've given up. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but we're glad to have you here. Uh, thank you for your work. Okay, so we'll take some questions. Uh, maybe I'll take three, three to start, and then we'll get another round here. This one here, go ahead. Please identify yourself, too. Um, 
Is it on? Yeah. Um, my name is Rebecca Bill Chavez, um, and I have a question, I think, all f to all four of you. Um, and maybe there'll be agreement on this, maybe not. So um, I used to be a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere um, under Obama. And one of the things that we heard frequently from U.S. Southern Command in particular, um, not as much from NORTHCOM, but definitely from SOUTHCOM, is the threat of this nexus, this nexus between criminal networks and, and terrorism. I think that the term right now that's, that's being used is nefarious networks. That these Latin American, Mexican, um, Latin American criminal organizations are, are building ties to terrorist networks and it's a threat to the homeland. So um, my question for you, especially because you guys are on the ground, you're conducting field work, and I'm really struck by the, the interviews um, that, you, that, you're, that you've been doing in particular. Um, are, what are, you, are you seeing this? Are you hearing this? What are you seeing and hearing on the ground? Um, in particular, Nick, you made um, a point of this about the Sinaloa the in New York and the, the this, this new kind of model with fentanyl that is bad for business to draw attention. Um, and I think that the, the, counter, the counter logic to this, this nexus narrative is that it would be bad for business, it would draw attention. Um, so that the state, I think actually Guadalupe, you said you, Guadalupe, you said the state, you don't want the state to look at you. Um, so I, I'd be curious to hear what, what one or all of you have to say about that. The question down here with June, oh, and then right in front of June, uh, but the mouth. June Vital with the Congressional Research Service. Um, uh, I'm reading this Guadalupe, but have you seen the book by um, Martinez, Duran Martinez, the the politics yeah. of drug violence? Yeah, yeah. Because there yeah. there is a description there, right. very localized description of with why you Colombia. use violence right. as a tool, um, a divisible violence, um, as a as a tool to gain legitimacy. But um, my question is about. Um, I think I saw it, Steve, on yours. Uh, which of these groups has used the vigilante discourse? Um, I think you're mentioning it with CJ and G here. Um, did the Zetas, I don't think so, ever use that, but curious if they did. Um, and then Vonda to you about legitimacy through using the vigilante kind of, um, or the, the auto defense kind of self-defense metaphor. And then right in front there, Bernardo Rico, um, I work and live in Central America for about 15 years and have a small nonprofit focus on drug policy. I'm really interested to pick up on Vanda's question, and it's one of those things that kind of keeps me up at night about the why of the violence. And I'm, I'm sorry, Guadalupe, I wasn't here for the, your initial presentation, but I'll definitely read your book and, and look at the video bef um, afterwards. <laughs> and I, to ask Nick also, um, if you actually did any uh, reporting on the violence in Guatemala, particularly I'm thinking of when I lived there, when the Zetas slaughtered, I think it was 43 peasants all throughout the night, and they um, used machetes. At the ranch in Petén? At the ranch in Petén, yeah. So I'm just, I, that's what I remember, and how kind of narco-trafficking really kind of came, came on, the, on the front burner for, for Guatemala and the Northern Triangle. But the question I have kind of transcends the whole question of the why and the violence, because it's not just the set does, it's, it's not, I think, particularly be probably because they started off as a military organization, um, other cartels in Mexico, but Guatemala has always been violent, El Salvador always be, has been violent, the cartels in Colombia has always been violent, going back to its own civil war in the 50s. You look at Brazil and how violent they are, and I know this is, I didn't hear the co initial comment that you made about the civil war in Mexico, but I'm curious, maybe being a little bit, um, not politically, politically correct as well, but thinking about the why Latin Americans, um, when they use, um, when they have criminal groups and, you know, in the absence of the rule of law, because I think it goes beyond the absence of the rule of law, why are so many of these countries and the criminals organizations that um, operate in them so violent? Okay, let's take that round. Um, Nick, you want to start off? We'll just move our way down sure. the panel. Um, Rebecca's question about the nexus between terrorism and business. I don't know. I've, I've always been skeptical of claims, not only from Southcom, but from folks, um, uh, you know, at all different levels of the United States government about the con connection between terrorism. I, I, I've, I've al I also had the impression that sometimes, um, you know, policymakers have tried to hype up the terrorism nexus in Latin America in order to you know, to, to, to 
make their patch seem more important to fit into the larger strategic and defense goals of the United States government. Um, and the impression I've always had um, along the border in particular is that it's well known that if you dabble in anything that smells like terrorism, you're really asking for it. You know, that if you if your goal is to make money and, and to run your criminal organization and to be powerful, the stupidest thing you can do is, like, get involved with something that seems like, you know, um, Islamic terrorism or, you know, f strange foreigners, even if, they're, if, if they come offering, you know, a lot of money. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen... You know these. The, you know the, there was the, several years ago. There was all this speculation. Oh, are the you know are the are the cartels and their dominance of the borders that gonna are they gonna start like moving you know jihadist terrorists into the United States? And it just didn't happen. It was just, I, th I think it, you know it, you know it's just a terrible business idea, and um, nothing would provoke the you know the wrath of of the not only the you know the United States government but the full force of the Mexican security state, um, which lets. You know, as we know, a lot of a lot of illicit business go on. So, um, and then um, you asked ab uh, about the about that incident in in Guatemala and Petén. I remember that very. I went there afterward. We went to uh, uh, my colleague William Booth and I went to um, Alta Verapaz, right after uh, they declared the government, Guatemalan government. You know, after that incident, said this is an. Um, I think it was like a national security threat or it was a estado de excepción, yeah. Um, and we found, um, you know, that we, I remember go going to a house that, that allegedly had been like a Seda safe house where they had come and, and um, uh, driven off the owner of the, of the house and used it as their command center to try to sort of run illicit activities through there. Um, but their presence in Guatemala was, you know, fairly long term and, and fairly well established. And, you know, I think... Um, I think that you know that that, that both the the Sinaloans and and other groups in, in going back to the Gulf Cartel have always you know seen the importance of having a a presence in Central America, not necessarily to take over territory in the way that the Sedes did, and they probably um, again kind of provoked a counter reaction that wasn't necessarily in their best interests. But there have always been trafficking groups in those areas in in Central America, particularly like trafficking families that have have aligned themselves with. With um, transnational criminal organizations to um, you know to move narcotics to there, and I think you know that business continues to this day. Great, thanks, Wanda. Rebecca, you know the issue of the crime terrorism nexus is very complex and very um, place specific. What very frequently happens is that a militant group takes over territory that happens to have all kinds of illicit rackets. It needs to, and it needs to adjust to how it deals with these illicit rackets. The FARC, when the, in the 1970s they encountered the coca economy, they considered it the height of capitalism and tried to suppress it and in fact tried to eradicate it. Until they, of course, tremendously backfired on them, exploded on them, <coughs> they lost the cocaleros, <coughs> they lost the campesinos, and they say, all right, well, we have to tolerate it. And you're sitting, and the Taliban had exactly the same learning experience. You're sitting there, you're watching it. You cannot suppress it because it's so politically costly. It costs you so much political capital. And you tell yourself, well, OK, since we are sitting here watching it, why don't we tax it? And progressively, uh, many militant groups get in sucked into other aspects of uh, the economy. And, and in that sense, the diversification of the Zetas and other criminal groups into broader taxation is, again, the very standard evolution of what a militant group, what any ruler, not just a militant group, a criminal group or, or a um, militant group, does when it exists in territory. There is a crucial function of taxation that is not money. Taxation is about authority. It's not surprising that states that have very poor taxation levels, such as Pakistan, or very skewed ones, such as Mexico, have issues with rule of law and, um, and the basic social contract. Because taxation is about legitimacy and social contract, and it's about authority. Uh, and so you get a great amount of, of authority and political capital by simply levying taxes. Now, if you levy taxes to the point that you kill your business, you are very... Uh, ineffective and counterproductive in your authority building, um, proto-state building enterprise. That said, like Nick, I've never seen the crime terrorism nexus in Mexico. 
there are often allegations that Hezbollah and Hamas is behind every rock, and that particularly at the, the time of the height of the Zetas, there were many stories about how the Zetas might be susceptible to smuggling in Iranian-linked um, operators. And I was here at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center giving a talk when the story broke out about the effort to hire uh, the Zeta Iranian presumed connection to assassinate uh, the Saudi ambassador in Washington, D.C., and the, the flutter that Washington was in, of course, it turned out that there never was any real connection. It was a DEA sting operation. Um, so, you know, it's, it's easy to make allegations, and, and often those allegations look at, well, this person knows this person, and this person knows that person, and there are three, five, four degrees of separation, and that means there is a nexus. To me, those tangential links are not a sign of nexus, and I want to, again, in endorse what Nick said. With all the challenges of the U.S.-Mexico relationship at various times, the one thing that has worked has been counterterrorism cooperations. Whatever the Mexicans do on the southern border or don't do, people of, uh, with Iranian or Arabian sound, uh, sound, uh, sounding names who are smuggled through the border have very poor chances. And this existed even in the back uh, of the 1980s. And it's something that the Trump administration should be mindful of how it seeks to rock and dismantle uh, the, or, or, or change <laughs> the U.S.-Mexico security cooperation that what matters far more even than whatever drugs make it to the U.S. is uh, that the southern border is not the site of a um, terrorist attack that people were predicting and latching onto and everyone was saying it's only a matter of time uh, before it happens bet uh, before 2001. And one reason it didn't happen is both the safe restraint of Mexican criminal groups and some level of realization that there are red lines that are not crossed, but also, crucially, um, the level of cooperation. June, legitimacy and vigilantism. Well, the self-justification for vigilantism, of course, is because the state has failed in providing the most fundamental role of the state, which is public safety, right? But vigilantism in that sense then becomes very useful for everyone to latch onto. And, uh, you know, you have so many ironic aspects to it. La Familia Michoacana and La Tem the Templarios, which were impetus in their in their brutality and excesses uh, for the stimulation of the widespread uh, emergence of vigilante groups, of course, claimed, and they were, in fact, uh, regulating not just criminal markets, but they were regulating public spaces in a way that was often brutal, often excessive, but nonetheless outperformed the state. And so then you have the creation of militias, but militias become a very convenient cover, and so as you move from Michoacan to Querero, you know, what's the difference between a militia group and, uh, and a drug trafficking group? Many small local drug trafficking groups simply label themselves the defenders of the people X, Y, and Z. And the other problem with militias is I have studied militias across the world. I have not yet seen one militia that st stood up for whatever legitimate reasons ended up legitimately dismantling itself and saying, okay, there is now peace, there is now rule of law, let's all go home, and we will now obey the police and the state. Uh, <coughs> the overwhelming tendency is we try to be the rule of law and often in ways that replicate new forms of predation and abuse um, of local population, however legitimately motivated uh, their intentions were. And my... Um, you know, final comment on the issue of, of violence. I don't actually find it very s surprising at all that the Zetas started their model with brutality. There are many reasons for that. One is there are lots of other groups. After all, they were the subordinates, the enforcers, the split off from the Gulf cartel. How do you, wh why should someone obey the newcomer where you have a lot of existing institutions with their networks of s obedience, with their networks of corruption? You need to persuade people that they should defect from Gulf, they should defect from Sinaloa, they should defect from La Familia Michoacana and pay to you and obey you, right? And you do it by saying, well, you're tougher. The penalties of disobedience are much tougher. So I don't find that surprising, both their origins as enforcers, the need to outperform the others and the immediate thing they are, they are outperforming in is control through fear. What I 
what to me the, the more interesting puzzle is to one, well, why do you then not learn to calibrate uh, the violence? Why do you not learn to engage, to give out the handout to buy yourself political uh, capital? And it's the same puzzle that uh, I think is just very idiosyncratic to the groups. The same, why did Boko Haram not learn they should be more like the Taliban they, or, or more like Al-Shabaab? You have plenty of examples to learn from and some just don't. And it has to do with structures of leadership, sophistication of particular uh, leaders, perhaps um, institutional structures, but, but it's very idiosyncratic. The big puzzle to me, the, the Rosetta Stone, the, the, the most fundamental question of criminology is why are Latin American criminal markets so much more violent than criminal markets in East Asia? And I ask that question to my Latin American counterparts. I get responses from often cultural, historical, path dependency answers. I tend not to be particularly fond of those, but it's not that I can discount them. To me, the answer lies in the fact that law enforcement institutions, the state, in East Asia, despite many turmoils and sometimes transition from authoritarianism to democracy, has been able to maintain deterrence capacity of law enforcement in a way that has either been non-existent or collapsed in Latin America. But even to me, that's only a partially satisfactory answer because the question is why did the state in East Asia why has the state been successful in doing so, and why has the state in Latin America not done so? So I you know, self-admit there <coughs> needs to be further digging. But that is the most fundamental, uh, in my view, the most fundamental question. Uh, and then, of course, the second one from that is how do you then move from the state of no deterrence or very limited deterrence capacity to building deterrence? And so an example of that goes back to uh, Guadalupe's his book. The, the f issue that Mexico needs to resolve more than anything else is how do you make sure that Jalisco Nueva Generacion is no longer replicated? How do you make sure that they cannot engage, that criminal groups are not tempted to engage in that kind of aggression? <coughs> how do you deter this, the, 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 S the, the, struct the, the, the market's proclivity toward violence, which is so aberrant, but so fundamental in Mexico right now. Well, thank you. Stephen? Um, thanks. Just, just quickly on the crime terrorism ne nexus, we, we did a lot of work on this, and just, just to reiterate what they said, I mean, we, I guess three words. Uh, when we saw that there was some sort of nexus, um, uh, the three words that always came up was, it's just business. There's no, there were, there were, there were um, sort of very restricted uh, transactions um, between uh, individuals, sometimes between groups, but very, but more often in, in between individuals, maybe in service of those groups. Um, but there's no long-term arrangements. Um, there was no, uh, there we we chronicled also this case that that Vanda referenced as well, and a few others. Um, you know, this idea that this that they were seeking out, uh, and, and I guess this is the reverse of what, what Vonda was saying, but they were seeking out, the terrorist groups were seeking out and using, or trying to use the infrastructure of criminal groups in order to uh, perhaps, you know, move some materials over or personnel into the United States or something like that. Uh, we've, we've never seen that. Now, the, the problem is that is certainly and always a possibility. Okay, and because that's a possibility, then it's 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 impossible to put this uh, idea to rest, and and so that 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 makes it a very difficult thing to deal with in that regard. Um, as far as the vigil vigilante discourse, uh, yeah, m far more vigilante discourse from the Carta de Jalisco, um, and a far more sophisticated plan from the Carta de Jalisco from its from its onset, really. Um, they were their their roots are back in the Carta de Milenio, which was referenced earlier. Um, they were displaced by an organization, in essence, the Familia Michoacana, which had had a far more also elaborate discourse as it related to, um, you know, social control and protection of the local population. Uh, so it was um, there's far more discourse there. Um, the 
the thing that strikes um, us about looking at vigilantes across the region and vigilante movements is, uh, as Vonda said, um, they never, you know, turn around and, and hand in their weapons and say, okay, it's all over, we're going to go home now. Um, and even worse, uh, they almost always, I can't think of a case in which they did not become criminal organizations themselves um, and become predatory criminal organizations themselves. So it's not just that they didn't hand over their weapons and they, you know, maintained some sort of stability, it's that they became criminal actors themselves. And for me, this is this is a little bit part of this um, question of a civil war that, uh, that Guadalupe brings up uh, very prominently in her book. Um, for me, this idea of a civil war, is that the problem we have with it is this, the, that, that it's not so overtly political, these organizations. Um, but these are incredibly political expressions uh, of, of power um, in, their, in their local areas. Um, and their expressions of power are about um, this notion of, of, of controlling this space for their own uh, return, or in some ways, securing some other way of social mobility, because these are, these are areas that do not allow for a lot of social mobility. And one of the ways that you do have social mobility is through criminal activity, um, and one way to obviously accelerate that process is to have an armed group. Um, so this is, this is about that, that sort of control. And I think we need to think about these things, uh, these sort of modern-day civil wars, as um, not so much as political, but as privatized. And this whole question of all these spaces are privatized. We ask ourselves constantly why the institutions don't get developed. Well, they don't get developed because there's an entire discourse around debilitating the state nonstop. And there is a neoliberal economic model that has been implanted in our brains for 40 years now that is also a very important aspect of the way in which these, uh, that's the same space in which these criminal actors are also acting. And they're trying to control this privatized political space. These are privatized political areas, and that's the, that's the civil war we're watching play out now. Um, and and these organizations aren't necessarily political, as I said, um, but worse, they're just trying to replicate or create a space for themselves in this. And they're, so they're just trying to replicate the system. There's no, they're not trying to overthrow the system. They're just going to create one more or take part in a, in a more active way um, in this privatized space so that they can also be the beneficiaries. So there's no, there's no sort of, you know, tr our sort of traditional notion of, of a civil war, one system's going to overturn another. No, they're <coughs> going to play in this, they're playing in the same game. Um, and by, by the rules that they, as they perceive it, were made by somebody else. Um, and so that's where I think these criminal groups and these vigilante groups um, fit in that civil war discourse. Thanks. Thank you. And, and again, I would like to thank uh, my colleague panelists for this very um, enriching, sophisticated, and the three of them are people that have been on the ground you know, several years before I was here. So it's an honor for me to, to, to share a panel with the three of you. Um, and I just want to, uh, to try to answer these three questions um, in, in, in a way to add elements to the explanation of violence in Mexico. So we tend sometimes to think about what happens as a matter of criminal groups only. We have to involve the state, and this is where the vigilante groups uh, come to the fore in, in my book, for example, in chapter five, of how some, I mean, how, how the support, for example, in, Michoac or in Michoacan of the vigilante groups, that start as vigilante groups, and all, like the development of groups uh, at some point that, uh, like the Viagras, for example, when they came out. And so this, this, what happened in Colombia to some extent with the mili paramilitary groups, the vigilantes, and, and, and this, this, this very difficult way of, of <laughs> analyzing these actors without going back to the state. 
I mean, and state forces, and how the state forces and how levels of cooperation with the United States as well, anti-trafficking programs also determine the results of what happens in Latin America, for example. We cannot forget about the fact that we are not only talking about criminal groups. Well, we are talking about strategies, like the Kingpin strategy, uh, that had been repeated, and we know that it has not worked. At, well, I, I mean, at least, what, what, what about all these anti-narcotics programs or cooperation? They have been failed in the sense that they have not been able to decrease the amount of drugs that are consumed in this country and that are uh, and that are and that are uh, tra traded. I mean, we are we're we're really not understanding what we're fighting against. We're not fighting against drug traffickers or drug trade only. We're fighting against other groups. So, I mean, the level cannot be reduced to, to understand criminal groups or just to, to understand the connections of the Mexican state with these groups. But also, we have to go further. We have to think about policies and why the policies have, per se, um, added to the violence that we're observing. And why Latin America, uh, I mean, why, why the violence in Latin America, maybe, uh, I mean, adding to the, to to the to the to the explanation that Banda provided, we can we can talk about Carsi, we can talk about uh, Plan Colombia and and the Merida Initiative and the nature of the cooperation and the nature of the strategy that we have replicated bad strategies to fight a problem that we know how to solve. Which which instead of going and this is the same thing than with that with uh, undocumented immigration, why to penalize, why to criminalize supply and not demand or demand or helping the demand. Or, or, or combating the problem in a different way. Therefore, I mean, there are several elements that we are not commenting here. We're really not talking about only criminal groups. And what about terrorists? Uh, or, or what about the experience that, that I have had trying to understand these groups? I, there's always a possibility, and I have seen that, for example, and this is the, the, the past project that I, that, I, that I did, there was this tendency of us understanding the CETAs as they did everything. And this is why why we have to see it in, in parts, right? So how human traffickers and migrant smugglers are not the same, are not the set as some of them, I mean, they have, they have changed and, and they specialize in different activities. As, as of today, I haven't seen directly and, structure, and a structural relationship of terrorist groups like, you know, uh, a link to criminal organizations. And we know the nature of terrorism. They come from the places where we less expect them to, to come. And that's, that's one element of terrorism. And so at, as of today, only the, these, these very small links are people coming from the Middle East, but not a structural relationship of Al Qaeda, for example, even though uh, there were some studies and, and, and for example, also uh, some financial connections that do not necessarily, when, when the financial connections exist, when money is there, I mean, money from many, uh, formal and informal sources get together in, in, in the financial system. But that does not mean that on the ground they are together and they will come from the southern border. I, prob I probably, if I were part of a uh, terrorist group, I would not come from the southern border where they are waiting for me. I would probably come from somewhere else. And that might be the logic. And as of today, I haven't seen that structural relationship taking place. And, and with regards to, to why, you know, uh, I mean, the vigilantes, and 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 the, what uh, what what you were asking about, um, I believe that that we need to also uh, understand that that the state, the corruption, the involvement, this model, the involvement of this model of uh, law enforcement at the local levels and, and the responses uh, have also created violence and have also created this, what I call civil war. And let's remember that who declared the war and who militarized this conflict was the president of Mexico. He declared a war on drugs dress in a, in a military suit. And that's another thing where, where, the, where the term civil war might be appropriate to use. I mean, those elements that the control of territory were not only, uh, they, they were fought by the state. And, and, and that's, 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 uh, that's, that's, that's something that we also need to understand, analyzing these, these new configurations in a neoliberal era where, where businesses, formal and informal, get together 
uh, and are, are, are um, concentrated in the same spaces. Thank you. Um, I'll take one more question because we're really running out of time. Okay, two more, but that's got to be it. Uh, Dolia and one over here. Uh, mm -hmm. And let's make them short and sweet, if possible. Okay, very short. Uh, I'm Dolia Esteves. I'm a reporter here in Washington. And um, I just want to ask you something uh, quick. Uh, you have mentioned that, uh, obviously, that the uh, government has failed to deliver the message. Uh, we have 12 years of violence, intense violence. It doesn't seem like has any... Uh, has come down at all. So I was wondering is, is, is it not the, f the government's failure to deliver the message or the failed of the strategy? And is it time to change that strategy, particularly in a political year like this year, in which one of the candidates, which happens to be the one leading the polls, is suggesting a complete and radical change on the approach against the uh, cartels. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the young woman over here. Can you uh, take the mic right there? There, thank you. Hi. Hi, thank you very much for uh, meeting with us today. Um, my name is Patricia Jesus from the National Democratic Institute. My question is, um, just like formal business organizations learn from each other. What is the chance that transnational gangs like MS-13 might will learn from and adopt the CERAS and other Mexican cartels business model so that they be, uh, become rise to the level of transnational criminal organizations? Okay, thank you. Um, I leave it open to any of you that want to respond. I would like to respond very briefly to, uh, uh, I mean, to both questions, but the last one is interesting. Um, I believe that the, the model of MS-13 uh, is, is a model that we, we that means have some similarities with regards to the, the control of the territory, the destruction of rents, and, and also the diversification of some of the activities. Um, I don't think that, that they would learn from, this is a business model per se, and this might be uh, more understood as a, as, a, as a model utilizing like this understanding of, of the, of the um, you know, of the McDonald's uh, model where you have, when you replicate the same type, uh, like for example, the clicas, the, um, the what's, the, what's the name of this? Um, the franchise model. They operate like franchises. It's, 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 it's very surprising to see how Barrio de Ciocho, Mara Salvatrucha, in the three countries of the Northern Triangle, in, in, in each of the spaces, they replicate the symbols, the, the, what, what, what identifies them. And you don't really need a, a hierarchical structure. There's no hierarchical structure, and there's no connection between them in the three countries. And we have to, uh, I mean, to understand better the connections and, and, and here um, uh, inside crime and, and, and Steve did a great job with, a, with, a, with an excellent report that they have, uh, I mean, they have spent three years uh, uh, conducting research here in the United States and, and, and in, in the countries of the Northern Triangle. It's a different model. It's a franchise model that operates in connection with the state and that's where, you know, strong states and weak states make a difference with regards to the possibility of expanding the model in one way or the other one. When you have a strong state, you are not ha we will not have the same type of model that you have in the countries of the Northern Triangle. So more than trying to explain if they could they, they, they could, uh, I mean, they could copy or, or identify with, with groups like the said that they have their own model. It, it, it is, it is, it is, it is, it can be understood uh, like also uh, uh, through a business model. They have their own business model and this business model might not operate the same way. And my understanding of this and trying to conduct further research, considering theories of the state and the strength or weakness of the state, this is not a national security threat for the United States because, because the United States has a strong state. And, and the way that the gang model and the MS-13 spread out, and we, we, we'll, we'll try to make it more than MS-13, because MS-13 has more connections probably to the state, and some of the, some of the, some of the, of the gangs uh, dedicate themselves sometimes to, to, to traffic drugs or to 
to transport drugs and, and to sell them here, but that's not also like so structural or, or, or spread out through the through all like like the levels of that M13 work here. Uh, what I have seen more uh, here, and I, I need to do more research about that, and there are some projects that we have to try to, 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 uh, to try to analyze it. And, and this is what, what this amazing project did uh, in many regards. Uh, we have to be more careful of uh, and, and, and I have to be uh, more specific about, about this and also involve the state here. Also, also try to understand uh, how this works to, to be able to, to, to comprehend this better. And the question about, um, about this, about how politics, this is a very complicated question to answer. And, and, the, and the perception of some of the, of the proposals of, of the candidate about uh, pardoning or, or, or providing amnesty to these groups have been misinterpreted by the media. However, uh, if, we, if, we, if we think about this failed, because uh, this, is, this has been failed. Plan Colombia has been failed. Uh, Merida Initiative has been failed because if, if we understand these, these initiatives by their objectives, what are the objectives? This is, these are mainly anti-narcotics operations, programs to find nar uh, narcotics. The narcotics, uh, we have an opioid crisis in the United States, an opioid epidemic. So if based on that, uh, we need to listen more carefully to the proposal of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador in this regard. And we cannot just uh, and take into consideration, amnesty is impossible. It's, it's impossible. It's, I mean, the way it was framed by the media, but understanding it in the context of Chilaba, for example, and understanding what he was talking about when he was talking about the people that, that grow uh, uh, poppies, uh, poppy in, 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 in Chilapa, that may have been another context. Maybe he was giving another, another sign. But, but we might have to reevaluate the way that we address this, 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 this question and might, and might you know, cooperate or collaborate with other governments and maybe try to get to solutions that are better for the whole region and really addressing the issue of drug trafficking, not going after the kingpins because this, is, this has not definitely not gotten anywhere. We had the most violent year in the whole period last in, in 2017. Thank you. I, I want to just, because we don't have a lot of time, but just rephrase the question a little tiny bit. I mean, I feel like uh, U.S. policy in towards Mexico and Mexico's policy on this issue uh, takes very seriously the criminals uh, in involved, but not very seriously the issue of violence. Violence is often understood as an unfortunate side effect, right? I, I remember the Colorona administration even at times said, well, more violence is a sign of success because the bad people are killing bad people. The question becomes, is violence reduction a legitimate goal and a legitimate way to think about this uh, uh, from a policy perspective? Should that be taken more seriously or not? Uh, I, I, I think what I heard from Vonda was yes, but I don't want to put words in your mouth, Vonda. No, absolutely. I would say that is the absolutely primary goal of the state. However, I do want to say that the how the state goes about it <coughs> matters. And the goal is not just to negotiate an immediate ceasefire, but to achieve deterrence capacity of the state so Mexican criminal groups behave in Mexico the way they behave in the United States, mm -hmm. very peacefully. And simply negotiating a ceasefire out of weakness that gives blank check impunity, illegal under international law, to top traffickers is both illegal under international law, where amnesty cannot be granted uh, in the case of um, uh, crimes against humanity, which just about all of the top drug traffickers could be charged with. But it's also weak, and here goes the issue of MS-13. Uh, 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 remember the negotiated experiment in El Salvador. Negotiating with criminal groups is not a bad idea but the negotiation needs to produce greater deterrence capacity of the state and ability to enforce the deal. In El Salvador, it collapsed because the gangs themselves couldn't enforce the deal, but fundamentally, the state was not able to uh, even deliver the minimal issues that were agreed in the deal, such as to come with the development uh, um, packages into the, the peace zones. 
So I, I uh, very much stress that um, the, the reducing violence is the primary essential responsibility of the state that is the core of public policy. But it should come through means that strengthen the state vis-a-vis -vis the criminal groups and that build legitimacy and bonds between the state and local populations and weaken those legitimacy bonds between the population and criminal groups. In Mexico, unfortunately, we have seen neither of those three objectives. In fact, we have, I would make the argument that we have seen a worsening uh, of the outcomes of those three objectives. And so, yes, poppy eradication, it's not the way to go in Mexico. It's an easy policy, it's a counterproductive policy, it's not going to reduce our opioid epidemic. In fact, it will drive more people to fentanyl, which is very, very bad. From our public health perspective, turning off people away from fentanyl, suppressing supply of fentanyl, also from China, also from India, should be the number one um, law enforcement aspect of how we deal uh, with, uh, with the uh, public health issue, in addition to naloxone harm reduction, but just from law enforcement perspective. Um, similarly, high value targeting, very tempting, easily, very easy to succumb to. It's the siren song, it's the easiest policy to do, and it is very counterproductive. And even though we should move away from it, and I have long argued for middle level targeting, the answer is not stop going after drug trafficking groups. The state needs to go after them. It needs to bring them into compliance. It needs to prevent them, discourage them from becoming the Zetas, from becoming La Jalisca Nueva Generacion. Uh, but how one goes about targeting, how one goes about law enforcement is, is different than just uh, picking off uh, the top capos. But, but the, the right response is not Okay, just do what you want. Here is the, the blank check. Okay, let's just negotiate. Because it will be just like the vigilante groups. They will not become nice. Nick, Stephen, any final parting words? Um, I would just say that I think it's very evident that we need to have a, uh, an event on the MS-13. <laughs> <laughs> okay, stay tuned, folks. Well, we'll do an MS-13 event. We have event. in the inter-American dialogue, so you should... Uh, Flog your, you should flog your presentation. Room, so, you know, small room, right. Um, great. Well, thank you all. Nick, did you have No, that's right. Okay. Thank you all very much for your patience and hanging in there, and thank you for our panelists.